Moralia o Moral Writings. Translated by Frank Cole Babbitt and William W. Goodwin. On Envy and Hate. On the following view it is thought to differ not at all from hate, but to be the same. Thus one may say in general that vice, like a line with many hooks, as it moves to and fro with the passions attached to it, gives them occasion to form many connections and entanglements one another, and that it is with the passions as with diseases, when one becomes inflamed the other does. Thus it is the fortunate man that is a source of pain to one who feels hate as well as to one who feels envy. Hence we consider goodwill to be contrary to both, as it is the wish for one's neighbor's prosperity, and hatred and envy to be the same, since their aim is the contrary to that of friendship. But since similarities do not so surely make for sameness as dissimilarities make for difference, we shall endeavor to settle the question by examining the latter, noting first the origin of the two passions. Now hate arises from a notion that the person hated is bad either in general or toward oneself. Thus it is men's nature to hate when they think they have been wronged themselves, and again men reprobate and view with disgust all who in any other way are given to wrongdoing or wickedness. Whereas to attract envy all that is required is apparent prosperity. Hence it would appear that no bounds are set to envy, which, like sore eyes, is disturbed by everything resplendent, whereas hate has bounds and is in every case directed against particular subjects. In the second place, even irrational animals may be objects of hate, some people hate weasels, beetles, toads, or snakes. Germanicus could not abide the sound or sight of a cock, and the Persian magi killed water mice, not only because they personally hated them, but because they felt that God regarded the animal as offensive, thus nearly all Arabs and Ethiopians loathe it. But envy occurs only between man and man. In animals it is not likely that envy of one another arises, as they have no notion of another's good or ill fortune, nor are they affected by glory or disgrace, things by which envy is most exasperated. But there is mutual hatred, hostility, and what might be called truceless war between eagles and snakes, crows and owls, titmice and goldfinches, indeed it is said that the blood of these last will not mingle when the animals are killed, but even if you mix it, separates again and runs off in two distinct streams. It is likely, moreover, that in lions the strong hatred of cocks, and in elephants of swine, has been engendered by fear, for what they fear they naturally hate as well. Here, too, therefore, envy is seen to differ from hate, as animal nature admits the one but not the other. Again, no one is ever envied with justice, as no one is unjust in being fortunate, and it is for good fortune that men are envied. On the other hand, many are hated with justice, das those we call deserving of hate, and we censure others when they fail to shun such persons and to feel loathing and disgust for them. Good evidence of this is the circumstance that while some confess that they hate a good many people, there is no one that they will say they envy. Indeed hatred of wickedness is among the things we praise, and when certain persons praised Kyrillus, like Kyrgyz nephew, who was king of Sparta, but a mild and gentle man, his colleague remarked, how can you call Kyrillus a good man, when he is not even severe with scoundrels? And whereas Homer was very detailed and circumstantial in his description of Thesetis bodily deformity, he expressed the viciousness of his character very succinctly and in a single statement, most hateful he to Achilles and Odysseus. For it is a kind of extreme of baseness to be hateful to the best men. But men deny that they envy as well, and if you show that they do, they allege any number of excuses and say they are angry with the fellow or hate him, cloaking and concealing their envy with whatever other name occurs to them for their passion, implying that among the disorders of the soul it is alone unmentionable. Now these passions, like plants, must also feed and grow with what produces them. They are consequently intensified by different things. Thus while our hatred increases as the hated progress in vice, envy on the other hand increases with the apparent progress of the envied in virtue. This explains why when Themistocles was still a youth he said that he was doing nothing remarkable, as he was not yet envied. For just as beetles appear most of all in grain when it is ripe for harvest and in roses when they are in full bloom, so envy fastens most of all on characters and persons that are good and increasing in virtue and fame. In contrast unredeemed villainies intensify hate. At any rate, those who brought false charges against Socrates, being held to have received the limit of baseness, 
were so hated and shunned by their countrymen that no one would lend them light for a fire, answer their questions, or bathe in the same water, but made the attendants pour it out as polluted, until the men hanged themselves, finding the hatred unendurable. On the other hand supreme and resplendent good fortune often extinguishes envy. For it is hardly likely that anyone envied Alexander or Cyrus when they had prevailed and become masters of the world. But just as the sun, when it stands directly over a man's head, pouring down its light, either quite obliterates his shadow or makes it small, so when good fortune attains great elevation and comes to stand high over envy, then envy diminishes and withdraws, being overcome by the blaze of glory. Hate, however, is not made to relent by the preeminence and power of one's enemies. Alexander certainly had none who envied, but many who hated him, and it was these who plotted against him and killed him in the end. So too with misfortunes, they put a stop to envy but not to hate, for men hate even their humbled enemies, whereas no one envies the unfortunate. Rather it is a true remark of a certain sophist of our day that those who envy take the greatest delight in pitying. Here too, therefore, there is a great difference between the two passions, since it is the nature of hate to depart from neither the fortunate nor the unfortunate, whereas envy is no longer sustained when either fortune is at its height. Again, or rather this is what we have just been doing, let us examine the same principle in its negative aspect. Men forego hostility and hate either when convinced that no injustice is being done them, or when they adopt the view that those they hated as evil are good, or thirdly when they have received from them some benefit, for the final service, as Thucydides says, though small, if opportunity bestowed, wipes out a greater disservice. Now the first of these circumstances does not wipe out envy, for men feel it though persuaded from the first that no injustice is being done them. The other two actually exasperate it, for envy as I more jealously those who enjoy a reputation for goodness, feeling that they possess the greatest blessing, virtue, and even if they receive some benefit from the fortunate, are tormented, envying them for both the intention and the power. For the intention proceeds from their virtue, the power from their good fortune, and both are blessings. It is therefore quite distinct from hate, if what soothes the one torments and embitters the other. Let us therefore now take the intention of each of the two passions and examine it by itself. The intention of the hater is to injure, and the meaning of hate is thus defined, it is a certain disposition, and intention awaiting the opportunity to injure. In envy this, at any rate, is absent. For there are many of their intimates and connections that the envious would not be willing to see destroyed or suffer misfortune, although tormented by their good fortune, and while they abridge their fame and glory if they can, they would not, on the other hand, afflict them with irreparable calamities, but as with a house towering above their own, are content to pull down the part that casts them in the shade. 